Right. Now, I'm correct that this class has not met. We haven't gone over anything out of this chapter, correct? Okay, so we're going to start on at the beginning. So at the very beginning, when I tell you we're going to talk about the digestive system, what do you automatically know the overall purpose of this whole system is? Okay, what does digestion mean? Taking food, breaking it down. Why do you break your food down? To get the nutrients out of it. And what are nutrients? Carbs, proteins, fat, the things you need from your food, right? So what we're going to do is go through each part, each organ of the digestive system, talks about how it accomplishes that goal. Okay? It's got to take the food into the body. It's the job of the mouth. Break the food down into small pieces. So right? that's the job of the inside of the mouth. And as the food goes down, even in the stomach, we're breaking big stuff down into little pieces. Once we get it broken down into little pieces, how are we going to get those nutrients, those little pieces, out of the intestines and into the rest of the body? So you're saying it, but you're not sure if you want to say it. What's the only way we have in our body for things to travel everywhere? In your blood. So that's one thing that most people don't automatically assume. But we got to do that too. Once we get it broken down into little pieces, we have to transport it from the intestines into your blood so that all those nutrients can go everywhere for your cells to use them. Okay? Now, we're not going to do Chapter 24, but what Chapter 24 does is review with you what happens with those nutrients once they get to the, your cells. But we all know that already, right? What does your body use with the glucose, the sugar, when it gets to your cell? Uses it to make energy. Okay? You use the small pieces of your fats and proteins and things for the same reason. You use those to make energy as well. It's just a little different than what you've learned in the past. All right. So as we look through this, we're going to kind of just go in order, but you need to realize that some of the organs we talk about are primary organs. Some of them are accessory organs. The primary organs are all of the organs that make up the alimentary canal, which is basically the long tube that runs from the mouth to the anus. It changes as it goes through, but it's just one tube. When your food is inside of that tube, it's not really in your body. It's just in a little piping system passing through. We're going to take the good stuff and pull it into our blood. The big chunks, we just kind of let them pass on through eventually. Okay? Organs of the alimentary canal, your primary organs would be your mouth, down through the pharynx, the esophagus, into the stomach, through all these parts of the small intestine, then the large intestine, and then finally out the anus. That's the primary organs. Those are the essential organs. The accessory organs help all of those function to get your food through. Accessory organs are things like all of the glands around the mouth, which are your salivary glands, produce saliva. The liver, which makes bile, helps you to digest your fats, we'll talk about. The gallbladder, which is just a little storage sac. And then the last one that's important is this little pancreas right underneath the stomach. You're going to see as we go through, the pancreas is the most important organ for helping you digest your food. You can pretty much live without your saliva. You could live without your liver, your gallbladder, as far as digestion is concerned. But you can't digest your food if you don't have your pancreas. It's impossible to do. It's going to be one of the most important ones. Okay? What we're going to focus on in class, as I said, is the physiological functions. Okay? That means when you sit down and you start studying, you want to make sure you understand this chapter. You should be able to look at all of these six activities listed here and understand exactly what that means, what it means, and where it's occurring. Okay? That should be kind of obvious, I guess, for some of them. Obviously, we know where does ingestion occur in your mouth. Okay? You can't ingest in any of the other organs. That has to happen in the mouth. Okay? What does defecation mean? Pooping. It only happens at the anus. Okay? It can't happen anywhere else. The other four can happen in more than one place. And these are the ones I think you probably are not 100% sure what they mean just by looking at the terms. 
Okay? We're going to go through them more as we go through, but really briefly I want to kind of describe them all to you. The first one, propulsion. What do you think of when you think of something propelling? Moving, taking off. Right? Think of a boat has a propeller on the back of it, right? Okay? Propulsion in your digestive system is the way your digestive organs move the food through. Okay? You, can, you already know one of them. How do you move the food through your mouth? with your tongue by swallowing, right? That's one form of propulsion. After your food gets past your mouth, do you have to keep thinking, okay, food goes through my esophagus, okay, now I need you to move? No, it goes on its own. But there is some propulsion going on. You have different little muscles that squeeze and move the food through, and the name for that is peristalsis. Some of you have probably heard that term before. We're going to talk about how that works. Okay? Mechanical digestion. What does mechanical mean? It has something to do with moving parts, a physical digestion of food. Can you think of anywhere in your body you physically move a part or organs around to make your food smaller? In, in, in your mouth as you chew, right? That's an example of mechanical digestion, right? Nothing else is really going on in your mouth. There's a little other we're going to talk about, but the main thing that's going on in your mouth is your teeth and the movement of your mouth is taking a big, large piece of food, making it into a smaller, nicely formed ball of food called a bolus. Why do we need to make it a ball? Because what have we got to do with it? Get it down our throat. Okay? And your throat is much smaller than your mouth, so it has got to be compacted to go down. Okay? You cannot swallow your food as soon as you put it in your mouth. Okay? It, trust me, children try all the time. All right? Chemical digestion means using some sort of chemical to break a large piece of food down into a smaller piece. I heard somebody say stomach. That does happen some in your stomach, but not as much as you would think. Have you ever heard your stomach going right after you've eaten? That's because it's mechanically moving around so drastically. So your stomach does a lot of mechanical digestion. All right? Chemical digestion occurs a little bit in your mouth, a little bit in your stomach, but main chemical digestion occurs in your intestines. So you're, you don't really get started with the whole chemical breakdown until you get into your intestines. What do you think is the only thing we chemically break down in our mouth? Let me tell you how you can think of it. When you are chewing a nice piece of watermelon flavored gum, does it stay tasting like a watermelon? Mm -mm. It just starts tasting like nothing after a few minutes, right? Well, what were you tasting at first? Sugar, okay? So that's the easy way you can remember that. The only thing you chemically break down in your mouth is sugar. Just remember, whenever I'm chewing gum, it doesn't taste sweet for very long. What stays sweet longer, sugar gum or sugar-free gum? Sugar-free. Any ideas why? Because they have sugar in it. It has a fake sugar. Is your, can your body as naturally break down a fake sugar as it can a real sugar? No, that's not the way you were designed. So that's why sugar-free gum and things like Sweet and Low and things like um, Splenda stay sweet a little longer because they're not natural sugars. It takes longer for your enzymes to work on them. Okay? Makes sense, right? All right, number five, last one to summarize is absorption. That is the term that seems to confuse a lot of people because it sounds kind of funny. Absorption is absorbing something from one place to another, right? What is the one thing we're worried about absorbing? Or, or where do we need to absorb? Yeah, we don't absorb in the mouth. If we do, all we'd need to do is chew our food and spit it back out, right? W putting it into the blood, that's only going to happen in the small intestine. Absorption is taking all the good stuff we've just broken our food down into, absorbing it, putting it into the blood so it can go everywhere else in our body. Okay? So now can you see we got a lot going on in this chapter we got to understand, right? So just because it's one chapter doesn't mean it's not a lot of material. This is kind of common sense, I guess, in the sense that we understand we put a big piece in our mouth, it goes through, we break it down to little pieces, we keep the good stuff, and then we make poop, which is the excess stuff we don't need, and we get it out. Okay? Let me ask you this. Why do... If babies are breastfed for a very, very long time, for like six, seven months, they've never had anything but breast milk, they don't poop but about once a week, and that's normal. Why would that be normal? 
they're getting their nutrients from the mother. They're not, they don't have waste because the body naturally makes everything they need and they don't get anything else besides what they need. So they don't have a lot of poop. So if you poop a lot, what does that mean? You need to be breastfed. <laughs> no, that's not quite the answer. If you poop a lot, you're eating a lot of extra that you do not need. Okay. Now, the other day in my other class, they got to asking me, is it normal to only go once a week? And I know a lady that only goes once a month. And that's different for every person. Some people go every time they eat. Some people go once a day. Some people go once every couple days. If it's once a month, something's probably wrong. That's not normal. That's, that is, yeah, compaction and could have serious issues. Now, somebody did ask me if that could cause cancer. I don't know if that can cause cancer. I would just think it would cause a lot of discomfort, and it could be really bad for you if you never went to the bathroom. Okay? And then one other thing I want to say, some of you are already grinning at me. We're going to be talking about poop a lot for the next few days, I hate to tell you. Um, the whole idea of going to the bathroom, taking a poop, it's kind of a stigma in this country. If you go to other countries, you'll realize it's kind of a cultural thing. In other countries, they'll tell you they're going to take a poop. I'm not saying every country. But it, it kind of a cultural thing for us to not want other people to know what we're doing. But we all do it, okay? It is a scientific fact that we, uh, yes, even women, regardless of what your mom told you, even women have to do this every now and then, okay? It's not like roses when women go, but even women have to do this, okay? So we're not going to think it's funny. We're always going to understand it's part of it, okay? All right. So as we go through each piece, through each organ, each primary organ, we're going to see the same four layers. Okay, so we're talking in the pharynx, the stomach, the intestines, all the way through we see the same four basic layers. Now, one of the layers looks different in every place, and I'm going to explain that, but it's always the same four layers. Starting from the inside, the deepest layer, okay, we have what's called the mucosa. All right, now this, what would be the gap in the middle is called the lumen. Okay? Through that lumen is where the food is passing through. So the food is going to be first, it's going to come in contact with the mucosa. The mucosa is the layer that is most modified as you go through each one. It looks a little different. The only thing that's really the same about the mucosa as you go through each layer is what it is capable of making. What do you think the mucosa is making? Mucus, that's why it's called the mucosa. Okay? Now, what's different about it is generally what the lining looks like. There are several parts to the mucosa. We're not going to learn every little part, but I want to point one name out to you, and that is the lamina propria. And I point that out because you may see that again one day. If you ever have a colonoscopy, which you all will one day, if you've ever had one before, or if you're you know, young and your parents are having them, when you look at those type of reports, you'll see that word lamina propria a lot. And people, I've had a lot of people come ask me what that means. That's just one layer of the mucosal membrane. The reason you see it in those types of colonoscopy reports and things is because if you, they see some sort of polyp, which is like a, a a clumping or something like that, it's in that layer of the mucosa where they see that, that deformation or something like that, and the deformity. All right? Main thing that's going on, making mucus. Now, we'll see as we go through, in, for example, the stomach, we can secrete some other stuff out of the mucosa too, but it's mainly just making mucus. Why are we making mucus as we go all the way through this? So things can slide through. That's a very simplistic example answer, but that's perfect, all right? Because we are trying to put some stuff through. So we got to make it slimy where the food can just keep flowing through. Okay? <laughs> is a lubrication. Yes, that is correct. All right? What happens if when we get down into the lower parts of the large intestine if we lose lubrication? Hemorrhoids, constipation, hard time going to the bathroom. So that's the best example I can give you. Have you ever been trying to eat really fast because you had something to do somewhere ago, you didn't have time, and you swallowed your food too fast and you didn't like really chew it and get it mixed up with your saliva? It kind of hurt as you tried to swallow it. Okay? That's another example of not having enough moisture 
that can happen all the way through if you can't make enough mucus to help slide your food through. Okay? All right. Outside of the mucosa, the next layer is the submucosa. And what are all these red and blue and green and yellow things? Nerves, veins, arteries, lymphatic vessels. Very good. In the submucosa is where you have all of your interactions with your cardiovascular system, your lymphatic system, your nervous system. Okay. Pretty much can expect for you to by now understand why do you have to have blood vessels running through there. One reason is for absor absorption to occur, to put the nutrients there. Why else? Keep it alive because that's how you supply oxygen to all the cells in your body. Very good. Okay. What about nerves? Why do you need nerves there? So you can feel. Do you need to know when your stomach hurts? Yeah. Otherwise, oops, I had an accident. I did not know my stomach was hurting. I did not feel that I needed to go to the bathroom. So we have to have a lot of nerve supply down there. Okay. All right. Next layer is the muscularis externa. We always have at least two different layers of the muscularis. We have a longitudinal layer and a circular layer. So if you kind of watch my hand movements, I want you to kind of see why we need two different layers. Okay? Think, I'm, think about it as if I'm squeezing a, a tube of toothpaste. Okay? So I squeeze the end of the tube with my circular layer. Right? If I'm trying to get the toothpaste to come out, what would happen if I let that go and then just grab the next place and squeeze circular again? It'd go backwards and forwards, right? So the way our intestines and through our digestive system works, we squeeze the circular layer, and then we squeeze the longitudinal layer, move the food down, let that circular layer go, grab the next, squeeze here, and then squeeze the next longitudinal layer. So do you see how that would make sure that the food only goes in one direction? It, it puts it into sections. Okay? The only place that has a modified muscularis is the stomach. The stomach has an extra layer of muscle. Your stomach can not only move in those two directions, it has an oblique layer. That's why your stomach can really get to churn in and go in all different directions. Okay? That's what's happening when, when you hear your stomach growl. That's your stomach moving while it's empty. Okay? That's, it's physically moving. All right? Last layer is the serosa. It is continuous with all the serous membranes in the stomach. Okay? When you digested your pig in lab, right? When you cut it open, did the intestines just all fall out into one long piece? They were all held together, right? That was the serosa, that outside layer holding everything in place. You had to pull on that and tear it to be able to get everything out. Some of you were very dainty with your pig. Some of you grabbed and pulled to see how long. Those of you that did pull it out, how long was the small intestine of your pig? Anybody do it in this class? I can't remember. Anybody do it in this class? It's about this long when they pulled them out. They were all just amazed. Y'all need to do that this week. You need your pigs back out. All right. <coughs> so we kind of talked about all of these things as we went through. I'm not going to re read it to you. All right. So let's go through each organ. We're going to start at the top. And make our way down. So we're going to start at the mouth. We all know where our mouth is. We know most of our organs, and we kind of know what our mouth does. But there is a lot going on in your mouth. So you'll see there are several slides that refer to the mouth. Okay? The mouth is, can become a closed-off chamber for you to begin working on your food. Once you close your mouth, after you've gotten food in there, the superior boundary of your mouth is formed by your hard palate, your soft palate, and then the uvula hanging off in the back. The reason you have that little uvula hanging down is so when you swallow, the uvula goes up and closes off your nose so the food will not come up and out your nose. You can bypass that if you eat too fast, if you start breathing in heavily while you're trying to eat, like laughing or sneezing or something like that. But it's supposed to keep the food out of your nose. All right. The inferior boundary is formed by the tongue. The anterior boundary is formed by the lips and also the teeth. Okay. We've already learned some of these other parts. We know our tonsils, right? What are the palatine and lingual tonsils for? To filter what? The air or food is to get the bacteria, things out of the 
the buccal, the mouth, that are not supposed to be there. Okay. What do you think the tongue is for? Propulsion, moving the food out. It's for swallowing. It's a giant muscle. Okay. What's this little flap right here called? Epiglottis. What's it? What is it for? Closes off the larynx. So when you swallow, the uvula pops up. Epiglottis pops down. It makes sure the food goes down the esophagus in the direction it's supposed to go. Okay. Very good. Okay. If we look at a different view of the mouth than what we were looking at when we did the respiratory system, we can see a few other structures. We can see all of our teeth. We're not going to learn all the different types of teeth. You probably have learned that before in your life. The front teeth are for biting things off. The back teeth are for grinding. Okay, We're not going to go through all that. I think you guys know that. Okay. Now, when you go home tonight, I want you to do this to your mouth and your lips in the mirror and see all these structures yourself. Okay, but don't do it when anybody's looking. When you're by yourself. Okay. When you pull your top lip or your bottom lip down, you'll see a little flap of skin. That is called a frenulum. What do you think that's for? So it's, it's just to hold it in place. If you cut that, you need to take your bottom lip, for example, and stretch it way down below your chin. They do that in some cultures. If you've ever seen anything weird like that on like you watch National Geographic or any of those channels, that, that's some of those things that they'll do. That's how they can stretch those lips really far, but it's not supposed to be done. Okay? There's a little flap that holds your tongue in place. That's the lingual frenulum. Okay? Some children have to have that worked on when they're born. If your lingual frenulum is too tight, you won't be able to talk properly. You won't be able to suck a bottle properly. So they'll sometimes have to do surgery on that to get it correct. Other thing you can see underneath your tongue are the little bumps. Have you ever looked under your tongue and thought, that looks kind of gross? Right? Well, the reason it looks kind of gross is because you have all these bumps. Those bumps are the openings of your salivary ducts, where your saliva comes out of your salivary glands. Okay? You'll see two big ones in the middle right by the lingual frenulum. Those come from the submandibular uh, salivary gland we're going to see in a second. And then all the little ones come from your sublingual salivary glands. I'm going to show you in just a second. Okay? So everybody go home tonight. I want you to look at the bottom of your tongue. Make sure you see that. You should also see very dark blood vessels on the bottom of your tongue because your tongue is a huge muscle that you use a lot. If you cut it, well, I, uh, if anybody wants to see, I'm not going to show the entire class, but I have a giant scar on the bottom of my tongue. Because when I was a little kid, I was on the seesaw with a friend of mine that was much bigger than me. I was a little bony kid. And she got mad because I was in the air and she was on the bottom. You guys are seesaw, right? We were little kids. Well, she jumped off while I was in the air, so guess what happened? I went flying down, fell off, and guess what the seesaw did? Come up and hit my chin, and I bit my tongue in half. So it was kind of just dangling by a little piece of tissue. So I actually still have scars from where they had to stitch it back together when I was a little kid. So my answer is, obviously, I can still talk, right? It, it's not that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can cut any of that, and you, and you can survive it. It just takes a little while to heal. Okay. I don't really remember it a whole lot. Apparently, I was really cute. Um, trying to sing the Little Monkeys Jumping on the Bed song while they were trying to stitch my tongue back together. Um, but I don't remember it, but I'm sure it did not feel good. Because we all know what it feels like if you accidentally bite your tongue even a little bit. We all start crying like little babies because we bit our tongue. So I'm sure it was pretty rough when I bit my tongue in half. That was little. All right. The tongue is kind of a nasty looking organ when you stick it all the way out and look at it. How many of you brush your tongue in the morning? You'll all raise your hand, right? Okay. Do you think you should really be brushing on your tongue that hard? No. It's okay to brush it, but you should brush it very gently. My husband is over there just sawing on his tongue, and that drives me crazy. There are parts of your tongue that you do not need to be sawing on with the toothbrush. I don't want people to have bad breath, but the, if you stick your tongue out real far and look at it in the mirror, it starts to look kind of nasty towards the back, right? That's not bad breath on the back of your tongue like most people think. Okay? Your tongue is supposed to change textures as you get further back. All right? What you see on the front are little bitty tiny bumps. Right? Those little bumps are the fungiform and filiform 
papillae. Those are the ones that have little taste buds down in the crypts. Okay? Most of you don't brush those too hard, so you don't usually hurt those. The ones you guys really get after brushing are the ones more towards the back. The first big ones you see in the back are the circumvolate papillae. Okay? They also have taste buds in them. That's the first ones you guys like to saw on them. If you're sticking your tongue out really far and sawing in the back, guess what those bumps are further to the back? That's the beginning of your lingual tonsil. So you really don't need to be back there scrubbing on all that. Okay? Dentists have designed those, you know, the toothbrush that you can flip over and it's got that really soft thing on the back. That's what you're supposed to brush your tongue with. Now, I know most people are like, that's not doing that, and then you use the brush, but please don't brush your tongue so hard. There's important stuff there. Okay? There are some little serrated papillae on the side. They don't have any taste buds in those. Okay, but you can actually see those if you stick it out far enough. You'll see how the back of the side of your tongue looks different. So that's your homework. I want you all to go home and look at your tongue, bottom and top. Okay? All right. So I kind of started talking about the salivary glands. And let's, let's look at what they're for. Let's look at where they are. Okay? What do you think these salivary glands are for? They make what? Saliva. What is the saliva for? Without looking at the slide, tell me the functions of saliva. Keep your mouth moist. Why does your mouth need to be moist? So that your food will be moistened. In order for your taste buds to work, your food has to be dissolved in saliva. Very good. Is taste necessary? It's not necessary, but it is an evolutionary trait that we've kept because when you put something you're not supposed to have in your mouth, it generally tastes bad. And that's how we, it, so it is an important function to be able to taste. Very good. What else is your saliva do? What do we talk about? What happens when you chew your gum? Your saliva has an enzyme in it that begins breaking down your sugars. Okay? Very good. All right? Now let's look at our salivary glands. We have two large salivary glands that take up most of our cheek region in front of our ear. Those are called the parotid glands. The parotid gland has a duct that dumps out around the second molar. So that's where that saliva comes out, is up at the very top of your mouth. Okay? The other ones are down here. You have one below the mandible. So it's down here in your chin, right? So we call that submandibular. The one below the tongue is the sublingual gland. So they're, they're named kind of appropriately. Uh, real quick, I'll tell you another kind of cheesy story, but I thought it was funny. We were having dinner one night with this big group of people, and these uh, people a little older than me were sitting down from the table, and I, kept, I heard them, and they were throwing out a bunch of science terms. And I try not to be the science nerd when I'm out in public, but I kept hearing them talking, and they were arguing. And one of them was saying, no, they must have been saying carotid. And she's like, no, they were pointing up here. So I finally had to interrupt and explain to them that there was nothing wrong with their mother's carotid artery. They were talking about the parotid salivary glands. So those two words sound kind of familiar, kind of similar. They're very, very different. Parotid is just salivary gland. Carotid is that artery, right, that brings oxygen. So don't mix those up. It's kind of an important difference. Let's review a few things since we're talking about eating. What's this giant muscle that runs up and down right here called? Masseter, what's it for? The up and down movement of your mouth for chewing. Very good. The forceful part of your chew. This muscle that's cut right here that runs this way. What's it do? Smiling muscle. What's it called? Bucinator. Very good. Zygomatic muscles were the ones that ran up and down. They helped pull the lips up and down. All right. Come on. Some of y'all had me for a teacher. Y'all saw me do all my weird facial expressions. All right. Don't forget things you've learned in the past. Good. All right. So what's in our saliva? Mainly water. Okay. There's nothing really exciting about talking about what's in saliva. There are some other things. There's the enzyme that breaks down the sugar. It's the amylase. We're going to talk about that more as we get through. Uh, babies have special enzymes in their saliva that can break down fat. That we lose that ability as we become an adult. That's why babies um, eat milk for so long before they eat anything else. Other stuff that's in your saliva, it's mainly going to be waste products and 
different things that can help you fight bacteria that go into your mouth. Do you get bacteria in your mouth? Every time you put a piece of food in your mouth, you're putting bacteria in your mouth. Okay, there's absolutely no way your food is sterile. It may not have bad bacteria on it, but it's got bacteria that you want to be able to get rid of. Okay? All right. Now teeth, I told you we're going to learn all the different parts of the teeth. I mean, we're not going to learn the different types of teeth, but we are going to learn the composition of our teeth, because that's something I don't think you've ever learned before. Now we're going to be looking at a picture of a permanent tooth. The baby teeth are a little different. Okay, when baby teeth or your deciduous teeth, the milk teeth, are first formed, they do have a very tiny little root, but the root is absorbed so that the teeth can fall out. So what we're really talking about are the permanent teeth. Okay? And I think this is hilarious when I look at these standards in textbook now that I've had a child. My child is 14 months old and has two teeth. That's it. They say that children are supposed to have a mouth full of teeth by the time they're 14 to 18 months old. All their teeth are supposed to be in when they're 24 months old. Okay? Just to make some of you feel better, if you're like me and your child's like mine, don't worry if your children's teeth don't follow the standards. Mine didn't. My child's are not. The longer it takes you to develop your teeth, the healthier your teeth will generally be. They're generally a little stronger. Okay? All right, so what's the tooth look like? Well, here's the words. Let's look at the picture. You guys can study the words if you need to. Okay? So the bottom of this picture where my cursor is sitting, that's a bone, right? What bone would that be? Mandible or maxilla? This is actually the maxilla. How do you think I know that? What tooth does that look like? It's either an incisor or a canine, right? And that's mainly going to be one of these top teeth. But it, it could be mandible or maxilla. Okay? The tooth has three parts. The crown is the part of the tooth that sticks out of the gum. The neck is the part of the tooth that's in the gum. And the root is any part of the tooth that belongs down inside of the bone. Okay? What holds your tooth into the bone is the periodontal ligament. Okay? Anytime you have something interacting with a bone, you form a joint. Okay? This is a, a, a gomphosis, for those of you that remember that from Chapter 8, the type of joint. It's a non-movable joint. It's not supposed to move. That's why you have that ligament there. The next layer inside of that ligament is a layer of cementum. Do you think cementum is a hard material or a soft material? Hard. That's the hardest structure of your tooth. Okay? You don't want really, really hard on the outside because it would be brittle. So it's just hard to hold it in place. The majority of the tooth, the blue part, is made of dentin. Dentin is very soft. So on the outside we have enamel, fairly hard substance to protect that dentin. The reason we have all of this hard stuff around that forming our tooth is to protect this. That's the pulp cavity of the tooth. That is where the blood vessels are and the nerves. If you've ever had a toothache, it's because you have, have some sort of damage beyond the enamel and the dentin and you're feeling it down inside of that pulp cavity. Okay? If you have a cavity, that means you've left bacteria on your tooth long enough that it has damaged the enamel and they have to go in and fill it to protect the dentin so the bacteria can't get into the pulp cavity. One of the leading causes of heart disease in the United States is bacteria getting into the pulp of your teeth and going and loves to live inside of your endocardium in your heart causing heart disease. Okay? Now, when I say that, some people kind of give me this look like, can you believe she's saying I don't brush my teeth because I have a cavity. There's genetic differences in people's teeth. Okay? Some people can leave bacteria on their teeth for months and they'll never eat through the enamel. Some people can do it for a few days and the bacteria can eat through the enamel. Different people have different strengths to their enamel. Okay? So if somebody has a lot of cavities, that doesn't mean they don't brush their teeth. It may mean they just have weak enamel. Okay? All right. Ah, 20 slides and we're finally out of the mouth. Okay? I know a lot of that you already knew. 
but I always feel like it's kind of my job to point it out to you because otherwise you'll say, you didn't tell us that and you put it on a test. So if I put it on a test, you can all say, well, she did remind me that the maxilla would be where my, bone, my teeth were. Okay? All right. Pharynx. We learned in the respiratory system that there were three parts to the pharynx, right? Are we going to use all three parts for the pathway of our food? Which one are we going to leave out? Nasopharynx. Okay, so we're going to just let our food go through the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx. This is a shared pathway for food, fluids, and air. What happens if you get too much air going down this? And it doesn't go to your respiratory, it goes to your digestive system. You have gas. And gas in your digestive system has got, got to come out one of two ways. Do we all know the two ways? Up or down. Very good. I don't have to explain it. Okay. The lining of this pharynx, the oro and the laryngopharynx, is a stratified squamous epithelium. What was the function of that type of epithelium? That's the thick one. Protection. Do you think it's going to be abrasive for very large, solid, semi-solid pieces of food to constantly pass through? I would think so, right? Think about if you did this to your arm all day long. Your arm probably start hurting after a while, right? That's what happens as your food is moving through your pharynx. So you need that epithelium to protect so you can constantly make some more of it. Okay? Nothing really exciting there. Next, we're ready for our food to move from our pharynx and go into our esophagus. The esophagus is a muscular tube. What did the esophagus look like in your pigs you dissected? It was flat. Why was it flat? And no food going through it. Right? Those pigs were never born. Okay? If it has been at least two or three hours since you ate breakfast, your esophagus is going to be mostly flat. Okay? But it takes several hours for your food to pass all the way through your esophagus. Where do you guys think your esophagus ends? At your stomach, so point to it. Where does that be? Way down here. Very good. Okay? So you think about it. Those of you that like to eat like your food's going to run away. You guys know, you know what I'm talking about. I've seen people that eat like that. If you eat too fast, will you know you're full? You, you don't know you're full until your food fills up portions of your stomach. So if you're eating too fast, all you're doing is just shoving food into your esophagus, and by the time you feel full, your stomach tells you to stop eating. you got food running all the way through that esophagus, and then how are you going to feel? Yeah, you're going to feel horrible, right? That's how, if you've ever eaten and then feel horrible, that means you ate too much. Okay? You're supposed to feel good after you eat. Now, I stand up here and say that, not to be you know, preaching and saying, I never do that. We all do that at times, but you shouldn't do that. Okay? Your food just travels slowly through your esophagus. Your muscles naturally move it through. You don't have to do that. Okay? It does, your brain sends the food through. All right? There is a large sphincter. What's a sphincter? A muscular closing. Right? There is a sphincter at the top of the stomach that decides when the food can go out of the esophagus into the stomach. Okay? So now we need to kind of take a, just enough time to make sure we understand what, what physiology has gone, has happened so far. Okay? I like to stop at this point instead of keeping on going because a lot goes on in the stomach and the intestines. Let's make sure we understand what happened so far. Okay? We've done ingestion, right? What does ingestion mean again? Opening the mouth, putting it in. That's ingestion. Putting it into your mouth. While the food's in your mouth, you do mechanical digestion, chewing. Is that voluntary or involuntary? Voluntary. Do you have to have something to help your teeth while you're chewing your food? Your tongue. Have you ever thought about it? Not really, probably. But if you did not move your tongue while you were chewing, what would happen? You would chew the food that was in your teeth, right? And all the food in the middle would just stay big food. Your tongue right, is constantly moving your food while you're chewing. So as you're chewing, your tongue will push a new big hunk of food in between your teeth. Keep it from going down your throat until you're ready for it. So your tongue is a big part of that mechanical digestion process, not just your teeth. 
<laughs> I get you out of the way. All right, chemical digestion. What is the only thing adult digest in their mouth chemically? Sugar. That lipase, that digestion of fat, is only babies. So we're not going to worry about that. We're going to say, as an adult, we're going to think about the only thing we chemically digest is the sugar. That's what that amylase is. I keep avoiding the word because we're going to go through all of that in detail, what these words mean as we go through. Okay. Now we've done one part of propulsion. Okay. What did we say propulsion by itself meant? Movement. Okay. The one part of propulsion we've already done as we get to the bottom of the esophagus is deglutition. That is the fancy name for swallowing. Okay. If we look at that a little more closely, because, yeah, I know you all know what it means, but there's different parts of it that you may not have ever really thought about before. Okay? To actually swallow, you need your tongue, your soft palate, pharynx and esophagus to move the food through, and 22 different muscles every time you swallow. Okay? Do you have to think about swallowing? Is it voluntary or involuntary? I heard both answers. Guess why? That's right. There's a part of swallowing that's voluntary. You start it, right? But do you have to finish it? Mm -mm. Once you move it out of the back of your mouth, then your brain does the rest of it. Okay? And so the first part of it we call the buccal phase. Buccal is buccal cavity mouth. That's voluntary. We use our tongue and kind of propel kind of do like a little wave movement with our tongue, and that we voluntarily push the food back. Once it gets to the back, we have the next stage when it's in the pharynx and the esophagus that's involuntary. And so if I show you the picture of what's happening, okay, here's the first part. This is the voluntary phase. The food is being moved into the back of the throat. Once it gets into the back of the throat, it becomes involuntary. Why do you think your brain takes over when your food is right there? What can't you do if you have a giant mass of food right here, your epiglottis is pushed down, closing off your larynx? You can't breathe. Okay? That's what choking is. That's when the food gets trapped right there where you can't breathe. Since you can't breathe when your food is at that part of your throat, in that part of your pharynx, your brain takes over just to make sure it pushes the food on through. It doesn't leave that up to you, because if you forget, you would die. You would be able to breathe. Mm -hmm. It's just because it's coming out so forcefully. It's the same thing that happens if you're laughing and food came out your nose. You, generally, when you're vomiting, it's a it's forceful because you only do it when you, your body does that when something needs to come up, right? None of us vomit. Hopefully, none of us vomit on purpose, right? So it just comes out so forcefully. There are there are cases when people have done so much vomiting, like people that are bulimic, forcing themselves to vomit so much that it can trickle down into the respiratory structures, and they get a lot of erosion in their respiratory structures. That's a common problem that people that are bulimic have pretty severe, pretty nasty. All right, so once the food gets past here, your brain just keeps pushing it through. We propel our food through. Eventually, that epiglottis will pop back up, and we can breathe again. Okay, but there are a few microseconds when we cannot breathe every time we're swallowing. Okay, if you don't believe me, try to take a big breath in right after you swallow and see what happens. It, it takes a second. Okay, food keeps coming on through. Kind of to me looks like what you've seen on like Animal Planet. If you've ever watched a snake eat something, you know, or if you've killed a snake and it had a big bulge in it where it ate something, it's kind of what it looks like as the food is going through the esophagus. It just passes through all your little muscles, push it through. Eventually, you have this little sphincter at the top of your stomach. I had always heard it called the cardiac sphincter. Apparently, they've changed it. Apparently, now it's the gastroesophageal sphincter. So I, it's probably good for you to learn both terms because it depends on where you go after this and which textbook they use. It very commonly is called the cardiac sphincter because it's close to the heart. Okay? But it's just the sphincter at the top portion of the stomach that decides when the food can come through and go into the stomach. Okay? So now we're ready to look at our stomach. 
again, you guys know how I make my notes by now. You've been with me a long time. These are the list of the structures you need to know. So let's look at the picture and point them out. Here is what the stomach looks like. Okay? You'll notice, even though this textbook doesn't call this the cardiac sphincter, they call this region the cardia. So it, it's a term that you will probably see again, especially if you're going into nursing school. Your nursing instructors are going to be older than me. I guarantee you they learned at cardiac sphincter. And if you're working with a doctor that's 115, like a lot of doctors are nowadays, he's going to call it the cardiac sphincter. Okay? The stomach has two major curves. The lesser curvature is the part of the stomach that is kind of facing superior, facing upward. The greater curvature is the big portion that is facing downward. As you fill your stomach up with food, the greater curvature gets bigger. Okay, the lesser curvature note and really grow, it kind of balloons out to the bottom. Okay? There are three major regions. The top portion of the stomach is the fundus. Okay, so stomach, when the esophagus comes in, the esophagus doesn't just drain directly into the top. It kind of drains into the side. The fundus is the part that sticks up. The body is the whole piece that just expands as we eat. And the very bottom is the pylorus. And this is what another sphincter at the end that's called the pyloric sphincter. Okay? So if we think about what has just happened as we went through physiology, we just started dumping food into our stomach, right? Once our stomach fills with food, both sphincters will close. And we have, we already talked about the extra little layer of muscles. We have circular longitudinal and oblique muscles. All of those will start contracting, and our stomach starts going crazy nuts, shaking all of our food around. Okay? If you eat a big meal, and then next time you do that, eat a big meal, and then just go sit on the couch. I won't suggest it all the time. But go sit on the couch, and just kind of put your hand on your stomach, okay? your abdomen, right over here where your stomach is. And you'll feel your stomach moving around. Sometimes if you've eaten enough, you'll hear it kind of gurgle a little and... That is your stomach physically moving around trying to break your food down. Okay? Now, the very inner lining of the stomach is lined with this bumpy things called rugae. This is how the mucous membrane is modified in the stomach. I mean, when we went through the four layers, I told you the mucosa is the one that changes through each organ. That's how it's different in the stomach. We have rugae. Okay? And if we look at those rugae a little closer, each bump of the stomach actually is the opening of a very long crypt in the stomach. Okay? And I got a better picture in a second, and I'll show you what all these little different colors are. Okay? So that's how the mucosa is modified. We have these crypts with the rugae. And just to show you from a different view, we have different layers of muscles. We have extra layer of muscles. Okay? So now if we look closer at what's going on, Inside of the rugae, down in these pits, these little crypts, we have different types of cells. At the top, these light pink ones, and then dark pink, those are called mucus cells. What are they making? Mucus. Okay. Go a little further down, we have the little blue ones. Those are parietal cells. Parietal cells make something called... HCl. Anybody know what that is? Hydrochloric acid. Does anybody know what the pH of hydrochloric acid is? 1 to 2. Very, very acidic. Okay. You think that's going to be important? It's going to be very important. That's the only place in your body where the pH gets that low. Okay. There's lots of reasons that we let all of this acid produce in our stomach. One is very basic, so if we eat bacteria, the bacteria will most of the time die in that low pH. You take micro yarn, not all of them die, but a lot of them will die in that low pH. Okay? Now, if you think, I told you, when all the food gets in your stomach, we close off both those sphincters, right? We start moving everything around. That's when we secrete all this hydrochloric acid. The pH gets real low. Well, what would happen if that cardiac sphincter, the sphincter at the top, opened up a little bit while all that was going on in the stomach, what would leak out? Acid. Uh, no, we ain't got the bile yet. Acid. What do you think we call that? Acid reflux or 
heartburn. Those are just the terms we use for when that cardiac sphincter opens up a little bit and some of this hydrochloric acid comes back up into the esophagus. It burns because it's very, very low pH. If I knew you wouldn't sue me, I would take a little bit of hydrochloric acid and I'd show you guys what it felt like to put a little drop on your skin. I've had it on me before. If you'll notice, some of my clothes sometimes will have very tiny little holes right here at about my waist. And that's from working with things like hydrochloric acid in the lab, preparing things. Because if it just even remotely, a little tiny drop you can't even see, drops on your clothes, it'll burn a hole in your clothes and you won't realize it. Well, that's in our stomach. So if it starts coming up into our esophagus where it's not supposed to be, it burns. Okay? The little, what color is that? Purple? Okay, sorry. The little purple cells right here are your chief cells. Your chief cells make your enzyme, which begin some more of the chemical digestion of your food. Now you'll see as we go through, the only thing we digest in our stomach chemically are proteins. That's anything else, sugars, fats, DNA, RNA, anything else, we can't digest it. Only proteins in our stomach. Okay? And then we have just a few of them, but the little green cells down in our rugae, our gastric pits, are called enteroendocrine cells. What does the endocrine make you think of? Endocrine system which makes hormones. And what is the job of a hormone? Come on, guys. What do hormones do for us? Tell our organs to do different things depending on the hormones. That was day one of class. I'm mad at y'all now. Okay? Hormones are different little chemicals that travel through your blood and tell your body what one organ is doing so that everything knows what's going on. What do you think the hormones in our stomach are going to tell us? What happens when you're hungry? Stomach growls. Well, when there's no food in your stomach, your stomach starts making hormones that tell you you need to eat. Your stomach starts growling. Okay? Whenever you've got food in your stomach, does your stomach need to keep sending the hormone that you're hungry? What hormone is it going to send? Something to tell you to stop eating. All right? That's really the only two things the hormones in your stomach are going to do. Tell you eat or stop eating. Does everybody have the same ability their body's hormones work just as good. Mm -mm. There, are, there are scientifically documented conditions where some people cannot produce certain hormones fast enough, and that's going to make them more overweight. Okay, now some people can use that as an excuse, but that, there are, I've done that before, but there are some people that truly don't have those hormones. Okay? Well, everything I just said and wrote on that last slide is written right here. Sorry, did not know. Okay? All right. Now, I told you that those mucus cells were making mucus. Oh, well, that's true. They kind of left something out until I could explain everything else we just talked about. There's a lot of stuff going on in your stomach, right? And we said if some of that acid gets in your esophagus, it burns and it hurts. Okay. Well, do you think we need something to protect our stomach from all that acid? Yes. So not only does the mucus not only do the mucus cells make mucus, but they also make something called bicarbonate. Have we seen bicarbonate before? So can you tell me if bicarbonate has a low pH or a high pH? A high pH. Bicarbonate is high pH, basic. So if you take high pH bicarbonate and mix it with low pH hydrochloric acid, what do you get? Neutral, which doesn't hurt your stomach. Okay? Like we talked about, I think the way I tried to explain it in the respiratory was plus one minus one equals zero. Right? High pH and low pH, when you add it together, makes it neutral. So the pH in your stomach is okay. It doesn't hurt your stomach. If that acid gets out anywhere else, it's going to hurt everywhere else. Okay? All right. Now I've already said all of this, but just to review. What type of mechanical digestion happens in your stomach? Mechanical means what? 
physical moving, right? If you took a piece of solid food and put it in a jar, in a mason jar, with water and start shaking it up, would it break apart some? Yes, that happens in your stomach. There is mechanical digestion. Right? It's the churning. Think of that's, that's actually a better word than what I just used, churning. What type of enzymes do we have in our stomach? What do we d digest chemically? Proteins only. Okay, and that's again, here's the enzyme name pepsin. We're going to talk about those more a little later. Okay? All right, that is the only two things we're really worried about going on in our stomach. Now, when you take nutrition, you'll talk about this a little bit too. Your parietal cells also make something called intrinsic factor. They make HCL, but they make also make intrinsic factor. That helps you absorb vitamin B12. And there are certain people who have certain types of anemia. It's called pernicious anemia. Those people can't make intrinsic factor, so they can't absorb vitamin B12, and they have a lot of issues because of that. But that's kind of just a little side point of what's going on in the stomach. Okay? I'm more concerned that you understand the digestive system. Okay? Make sure you understand the terminology as we go through. When the stuff went in your mouth, we called it food. Once you chew it up and turn it into a ball, they start calling it a bolus. Okay? Now that it's in your stomach and it's been churned around in all that acid, now we call it chyme. Okay? If any of you have ever seen someone have their stomach pumped or anything like that, what does it look like that's coming out of their stomach? Anybody know? Nobody's ever seen it? No, yeah, the black is what they put in your stomach. But what I was trying to get you to come out with was what is the texture of it. It's pure liquid. Okay? A bolus is still kind of chunky. It's still food. But once it becomes calm, it is completely liquid. I don't want to be gross. But have you ever thrown, when you throw up, sometimes it's thick, right? That means you're throwing up something that hadn't made it to your stomach yet. If you've ever been really sick and you've thrown up a lot in a short period of time, Eventually, your, your vomit becomes liquid, right? Because that's when you start throwing up stuff out of your stomach. It starts burning as it comes up. That's the acid coming back out of your stomach. Okay, right? Nobody likes to throw up. I, I agree. I can remember being pregnant and thinking, oh, my God, just please don't let me throw up. But after a while, then you start thinking, please let me throw up because it does make you feel better. But at first, you're like begging to not throw up. Yeah, you can throw up your stomach acid. You can throw up pure mucus. If you're sick, like if you have a cold or something and you're making excess mucus, a lot of times you will throw up just the pure mucus being produced. The yellow stuff you throw up is the calm, the acid and all from your stomach. If, I, if you're vomiting from liquor, you're going to be throwing up just the liquor and the stomach acid. That's why when you throw up after you've had a long night of drinking, it hurts so bad because it's the liquor which burned going down. It's going to burn coming back up too and the acid from your stomach. Okay? One thing your stomach can do that I didn't put on this slide that you guys may want to write down is your stomach can absorb alcohol. Okay? It can, we haven't talked anything about absorbing nutrients yet, right? Because we haven't done any of that yet. But your stomach does absorb alcohol. So what happens if you sit down and say we all go eat Mexican food and we've got our chips and salsa, which we're all eating, and we've all got our giant margarita that we're drinking, okay? What happens? Do you get full first or do you get drunk first? You get drunk first because your body starts absorbing the alcohol before the food can be broken down. Now, if you sit there long enough, your buzz will wear off, right? That's because eventually your stomach will make it to where you can start absorbing nutrients from your food and not just the alcohol. So the next time you're drinking your margarita at the Mexican restaurant, you can start talking about how much you know. My friends really don't like me when I start drinking a margarita because I'll start spouting out things like, y'all know why you're getting buzzed instead of getting full? It's because your margarita is being absorbed in your stomach. I'm a lot of fun to go out to dinner with. What's even better is go sit somewhere like on the beach where you're sweating at the same time you're drinking and sitting down and then stand up and see what happens. You usually fall back down in the sand. All right.
And we can talk scientifically why, so that that makes it okay that I'm telling you that in class. I can remember being really young and stupid, and we weren't going to drink on the beach because that would be stupid because it's really hot on the beach and you're sweating, so you'd get drunk really fast. So we weren't going to do that. So we had the night before made. Um, do you guys know what whoop juice is? Trash can punch, some people call it. Okay, well, generally in the bottom of that you put fruit, right? So we were going to be smart, and we were just going to take the fruit to the beach the next day and just eat fruit while we were on the beach because that was healthy. Fruit absorbs a lot of alcohol. Don't ever eat the fruit the next day and think that it's going to be okay. It's really, really alcoholic. All right, last thing we'll do today is what regulates <laughs> your stomach secreting all of this stuff. Okay? We already talked about there's hormones. It can only tell us one of two things, right? I'm hungry or I'm not. I gotta hurry. Okay. So there's three parts of this. The first, the first part is the cephalic phase. Cephalic means head, right? This is what happens before you even eat. This is your stomach growling. That can be triggered by thinking about food. Seeing food, smelling food. Have you ever not even been hungry and you walk by and you smell something you really like and all of a sudden your stomach starts growling? That's because your body is in the cephalic phase. It starts secreting a hormone saying, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Let's go eat some of that. So your empty stomach starts moving around because of that hormone and you stomach growls, you get hungry. Okay? The hormone you're going to release at this point is gastrin. That's the hormone that tells you I'm hungry. Okay? The gastric phase is somewhere three to four hours after you've eaten. Your food's finally in your stomach. Okay? Are you going to continue to secrete gastrin the whole time? No. At some point you need to stop making gastrin because you're not hungry anymore. Then the last phase is when your food starts going into your intestines. We get it out of our stomach. And the hormone we're going to be secreting now is CCK, which is cholecystokine. And we're going to talk about it more a little bit next time. But you're also going to secrete something called gastrin inhibitory peptide to make you not hungry. So that's easy, right? Gastrin means make gastric juices, right? Gastrin means stomach, you need to work. I'm hungry, I'm eating. Gastrin inhibitory peptide says, stop making gastrin, we don't need to eat anymore. CCK says, all right, intestines, here it comes. Time for you to work. Make sense? That was kind of where I wanted to stop today. That was why I wanted to go there. Okay? So we'll pick up next time with what's going on in the intestines and we will talk about how we chemically break down all of our food.